Good morning. Glad to have you here this morning. It's a good day, or any day is good to worship. We're in a Bible study. Um, the elders over this summer have given the men of the congregation the opportunity to present lessons from the scriptures on different individuals, and the theme being God's second team. I presented one lesson. I enjoyed it. So then I saw that there was a blank at the bottom, so I filled in that. I thought I might as well. But before I did that, <laughs> I've been out the last three weeks. I've been ill. I've had COVID. I've had uh, kidney stones, and I've had a cardiac issue. So I, if I don't look like I'm real enthusiastic this morning, I am. It's just that I'm tired, and I'm, I'm a little weak. I'm a big guy, but it's taken a lot out of me. I used to play hockey as a kid when I grew up in Alaska, and we would call this a hat trick. Three significant events. <laughs> Luckily, my wife is a nurse, and a very good nurse, so she's taken very good care of me. A couple of trips to the hospital, but I'm here, and I'm thankful for that. Um, before we get started, I'd like to say a word of prayer. If you would, bow with me. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this opportunity and this time that we have to come together and study from your word. We are so blessed, Father, that we have this opportunity, and we are extremely blessed that we have this opportunity because of the sacrifice your son made so long ago. As we go through your scriptures today, Father, we pray we do so in a correct manner, that we not add to or take away from what we read, Father. And I pray, Father, that you would help me to do my very best to present this lesson in a way that's understandable and in some way beneficial to those who are listening. We thank you for this, and we ask your continued blessings in your son and our Savior's most precious name. Amen. My lesson today is about a character in the scripture, excuse me, in Philippians by the name of Epaphroditus. It took me a while to say that name correctly. I was referring to him as Epaphroditus, but it was Epaphroditus. He was a colleague of the Apostle Paul. What I want to do is I want to divide the lesson into three parts. First, I want to give you the background and the setting. Then I want to talk about the main actors in this event today, which were the Emperor Nero. The central actor was Paul, but the subject of our discussion this morning was his helper, Epaphroditus, at least for a time being. And then as we go through the scriptures, there are only seven scriptures or seven verses, I mean, so there's not a lot to go through, but I think that there's enough meat on the bone there that we can get something out of it. First, let's talk about Paul. Everyone knows who Paul was. He used to be Saul. He was converted by Christ. He was the only, on, on, on the road to Damascus, he was the only apostle. Well, actually, Matthias was chosen by Lot. Paul was the only apostle that was chosen by Christ after his crucifixion. Matthias was chosen too, but remember the apostles cast lots, and it was between two men, and I think uh, Matthias. So if you technically, you, you could say 
that, uh, that the Apostle Paul was the 14th apostle. Because remember Judas, he cast his lot with the devil. So uh, Paul, the year is about 62 AD. It's in Rome. Rome is a city of about 4 million people. And it's very lively and it's very busy. So what happens was with that Paul at the end of his third missionary journey, he's arrested in Jerusalem. Remember that? He was in the temple or in the temple grounds and he was preaching Christ and it caused a stir and a riot. So some soldiers like Wacomo, Roman soldiers, popped out of the, the fortress of Atonius and brought him back in. And as they were going to beat him, this Jew, this seditious Jew, Paul spoke up and said, I'm a Roman citizen. Uh-oh. So what did they do? They send him to Caesarea Maritima, which was the administrative capital of Judea at that time. And he's going to stand before Felix, and the Jews come up there, and they accuse Paul of various crimes, which they can't prove when we read that in Acts 50, uh, 25, verse 7. So Governor Felix, in spite of his innocence, keeps Paul a prisoner in the hope that a bribe will be offered to secure his release. We read that in Acts 24, 26 through 27. He knows that Paul is, if the Jews hate him this much, the ruling elites, there's something special about him. And he probably has means and followers, which means that there's money. So he's waiting on this to happen. So he's, he's a facilitates the possibility of a bribe, and he gives Paul liberties in Caesarea, such as not being bound, and the right to have people visit him or to provide for his needs. So under house arrest. So, however, a bribe never comes. Paul is kept as a prisoner under Felix from early summer of 58 AD until early autumn, 60 AD, until Festus is named the new governor. He replaces Felix. So it's before Festus that Paul claims since I'm a Roman citizen, request an audience with Caesar, in this case, be heard by Caesar himself. So, having been there for this long, they're not getting anything out of him. They're going to go ahead and send him on to Rome through Ephesus and to Rome. So he's taken to Rome by a centurion. His travel to Rome is considered his fourth missionary journey. So, the year 62 A.D., so let's back up. Let's talk about the person who he wants to go see is Nero. Nero, at the time, Paul is, <coughs> Paul is in Rome. Basically, he's a 24-year-old freckle-faced psychopath. Let me tell you something about this boy. His full name was Nero Claudius Caesar Augustus Germanicus. When he was 11 years old, he was betrothed to marry his stepsister, adopted stepsister. When he was 13, he was adopted officially by, by Claudius. When he was 14, he married his stepsister, adopted stepsister. And when he was 16, he came to the throne. It started out okay, but it went downhill really fast. He only ruled for 14 years, which isn't the shortest reign, but he did a lot of crazy stuff. One of the first things he did was he murdered his mother. He tried to make it look like suicide three times. And then the third time, he said, I know what we'll do. Let's get her drunk, put her on a party boat, and then sink the boat. Can't swim. Well, she died. Then the next thing he did was he took his half-sister that he married at the age of uh, 14, tried to make her look like she committed suicide. She ended up with slit wrists. But he wanted proof that she was dead, so he had her decapitated head brought to the palace so he could see it. Then his second wife, the official rose say that she died in childbirth. But the rumors are that have been passed down by historians through the centuries was that in a fit of anger, he kicked her in the belly, stomped her to death. This was the guy that Paul wanted an audience before, which... I believe was strategic brilliance on the part of Paul. Because look how long he's in Rome. Look how long he has an opportunity to preach the gospel with helpers like Timothy and with uh, Epaphroditus. 
So the ends justifies the means. He's preaching the gospel. Nero would only rule to about 68 AD. Then he committed suicide the day after the Praetorian Guard, which was the imperial guard to the Roman emperors. I've studied a lot about Roman emperors over the years. I'm fascinated with them. I have like a big bookshelf full of books about Rome and Roman emperors and the rule of different, I have my favorite ones. Not that I liked any of them, but just, you know, the way, you know, their efficiency, because I love military history. The Praetorian Guard, the day before he committed suicide, denounced their support of him. When that happens, you're done. The Praetorian Guard was an elite group of soldiers, usually in cohort form, around four to 600 soldiers around the royal palaces. They were the only ones that could carry arms inside of a certain parameter. They had land, they had favors, they were paid about three and a half times the rate of a regular legionnaire was paid. So they were called king breakers and king makers, and they certainly were. Nero didn't live by that, and it caught up to him. One of my favorite emperors to study was uh, a guy by the name of Lucius Septimus Severus. When I think of the movie Gladiator, where you see Russell Crowe riding the line on a steed with the sword, and he's extolling his men in Germanica to hold the line, boys. We're going to take him now, and right before they engage with battle with the barbarians. And it's just a glorious scene where his armor is shining. He's riding down the line, and you can see the adoration and the look of the soldiers' eyes. They would follow this man to the gates of hell. This was the type of emperor that Severus was. He ruled for about 18 years, about four years longer than Nero, but the reason why I pick him just out of the blue to tell you about him today, well, an interesting side note was, well, it's not an interesting side note, it's a major side note. He was the first African emperor of Rome, and he understood the assignment. He was bad to the bone. When he was on his deathbed, he said something that all Roman emperors should have followed, and the ones after him should have followed. Those who did survived and were successful, those who didn't weren't. He told his sons, he never was assassinated, he died of illness while on campaign. He told his sons at his deathbed, always be good to one another, because he had come to power after a brutal civil war in the empire. Always be good to one another. Then he said, always enrich your soldiers. And then his third bit of advice was, damn the rest. What he meant by that was, Remember who butters your bread. Your military is what keeps you in power. Your military can take you out of power. So no matter what, you take care of them. He did that for 18 years. He beat back the Parthians in the east and in the west. He went to Britannica, and I think he rebuilt Hadrian's Wall or helped to rebuild it. He, he made the borders of the Roman Empire expand further than any other Roman. And like I said, he was the first African Roman emperor. Back again to Nero. Nero didn't follow that advice. He started off okay. You know, he never dressed in the same clothes each day. He wore a different robe. He had all kinds of weird habits. He fancies himself of an artist. He did all kinds of things. He used to dress his, uh, some of, I don't know if it was his freedmen or his service. He used to dress up as the bride and marry them in ceremonies. I mean, it just goes on and on. I know a lot of people will say, yeah, but the people who wrote the history about Nero and these other, these other uh, emperors, they didn't like him. So that, no, there was just so much bad stuff by different sources written. Even if like 10% of it was true, it's like, whoa. And as a freaky link here, Whenever Nero committed suicide, guess who was with him at his side? A freedman and his personal secretary whose name was Epaphroditus. Not our Epaphroditus, but another one. Epaphroditus was a very common name in the Greek and Roman world. We see it on lots of inscriptions. What it means is um, 
belong to Aphrodite. And in the Greek, it means handsome one. I think in the Hebrew, it means, or, I mean, the Greek, it means beautiful one. In the Greek, I think, or Hebrew, I think it means handsome one. We don't know much about Epaphrodite. We do know that he came from the um, city of Philippi. We can extrapolate some things out of this information. The city of Philippi were, was conquered by the Romans in about in the 40s BC. After it was conquered, it became a very popular spot for Roman legionnaires or soldiers to retire to. They'd be gifted with land. And also, Praetorian Guard, there was a big, apparently there was a big retirement community of Praetorian Guard there too. So if you lived in Philippi, you were either related to, knew someone, or were past Roman legion soldiers or Praetorian Guard military. It's sort of like us here. We either know someone that works at Disney either work at Disney, but we certainly know of Disney. That's the way it was in Philippi. The reason why I'm bringing this up now is because this will come in later on when I want to talk about it when we're reading through the scriptures. So we read in Philippians 4.18, Philippians 4.18, I have received full payment. This is Paul when he's writing Philippians, co-authored by, they believe, Timothy He's saying, I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied now, and I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. So we know that Epaphroditus brings a care package to the Philippians, um, to Paul from the Philippians, the church at Philippi. And he's there to help Paul in any capacity he can, and he does, and we'll get to see that here. But Paul's, remember, when Paul's, we're reading someone else's mail. Philippians is an epistle. Epistle means a letter. Paul's writing to the Philippians, and he's thanking them for what they sent by way of Epaphroditus. So, if you go over to Philippians 2, we'll start in verse 25. We'll be reading 25 through 30. We'll talk about what happens here. Verse 25, this is after all these events have happened. Epaphroditus has been there for a year. All these events have happened. So Paul's sort of like summarizing what has happened. And he's going to send this actual letter that we're reading today of Philippians back by hand with Epaphroditus. So we can credit Paul for writing it, God and the Holy Spirit for inspiring him Epaphroditus was the third part of that where he actually took it to the Philippians and then they would pass it down through the ages until the different books of the Bible would become canonized. So he says in verse 25, I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my needs. Excuse me. So he first, he does this in ascending order. He says, my brother... He's equating the importance of Epaphroditus to himself as equals. My brother. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. We are equal to each other. God is no respecter of persons. I mean, we have elders that guide us, but that's important because we do need mature men who are mature Christians to help lead us along the way. That's a necessity, and God saw that, so that's why it's been implemented. But... As far as God's eyes, we are all the same, brothers and sisters in Christ. So right off the bat, at the very base of his comments, Paul said that Epaphroditus and I, we are brothers. And then the second one, he says, fellow worker. That's because Epaphroditus went on for several months, a year and a half, or however long it was, and did everything he could to help Paul in Rome. And he was probably familiar with Rome, and I'll explain that to you with the next application that I make here or the next point I bring out. And Paul says, a fellow soldier. Now, we know in this instance that Paul is being, he uses that terminology all the time. Paul was never a soldier in the Roman army. 
that he uses uh, symbolism in, in speech about, about the military, about athletics and racing. Paul was the apostle to the, to the Gentiles. He understood the Greek world and the Hellenistic world. So a lot of times when we say Pauline style, that's what we're talking about, is Paul is using symbolism and that the Greek or the Hellenistic world would understand. But remember whenever I brought up that point about Philippi being a center that were, um, where retirees from the uh, Roman military would go? Well, I read or came across an interesting study online. I had heard this before in years past in my studies, and it does have some credence. Although Paul was talking about being a soldier met metaphorically, a met fellow soldier. Let me query you this, and you can think about it and do your own study on it. He said, apparently, that Epaphroditus was very effective there in Rome. Could it be that Epaphroditus was possibly re a retired Roman legionnaire or even a retired Praetorian guard? Because in Luke, in, in Acts, Luke talks about that, uh, oh, it says here, in, let's see, in, well, Paul himself says, I want you to know, brothers, in Philippians 1, 12, 13, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel, so that it's become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest of my imprisonment in Christ. And in the end of Acts, which Luke wrote, it ends abruptly, but it alludes that Paul had had his case adjudicated by Nero. My problem with that, and I'm not criticizing the Bible, no, I'm not. From all the study I've done, Roman emperors only adjudicated criminal cases. They didn't adjudicate uh, 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 other cases. And then it was only a limited number, and it was usually high profile. They just didn't have time. Rome was a city of four million people, and the Roman Empire comprised about 50 to 60 million people. And about a third of those, well, less than, well about 25% or a third of those had Roman citizenship probably. That's what Paul was relying on. Did he come before Caesar? I don't know. I would like to think he did. But at the very least, he was exposed to the Praetorian Guard. And they would be responsible for security for all the, all the judicial courts and stuff like that. That's why, the, at least intriguingly, w w way um, the thought that maybe Epaphroditus had been either a Roman, retired Roman legionnaire or, or uh, a Praetorian guard. Now, we, let me see if I can pick up here again in my verses. I did 25. I'm sorry if my thought process seems scattered this morning. I'm sort of in a fog. Um, in verse 26, Paul says of, uh, of uh, Philippians 2, 25 through 30, he's talking about Epaphroditus now. He says, for he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. In verse 27, indeed he was ill near to death, but God had mercy on him and not only on him, but, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. So Paul, over these months, past year or two, he's grown very close to Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus has been a help meet to him, a, 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 a boy Friday, you say girl Friday, a boy Friday, or whatever you want to refer to him was. He was his secretary, his confidant, probably. I remember when my wife, she really, she's a very, very smart person. When she was in graduate school and she was doing her thesis. It took her about a year and a half. And I was just all uppity, man. I was going to help her. Let me help you. So to make me feel better, she says, well, I'll let you look up a few things. So I was looking up. I was like her secretary. <laughs> and I was looking up some stuff on the internet and said, aha, I got this. Aha, I got that. And then she would look through it and it was like, she would only use like two things. And she says, oh, I can't use this. It's improper citation. I can't use this. It's suspect and sketchy, the inferences that they're making here. I can't use this. It seems to be polo politically motivated. I have to use critical thinking and go right down the line. I don't think that 
Epaphroditus did exactly that, but if he worked so hard that it brought him to his knees and almost to death, he was doing a lot of things. And I would like to think in my imagination, in my fanciful imagination, you know, even if there's a slim chance that Paul may have been a Roman legionnaire or retired a Praetorian guard, how helpful would that have been to Paul in those circles? He knew people. He knew things. Wouldn't that have been incredible? And wouldn't that have been the perfect envoy, envoy for the Philippian church to send? Somebody that already knew what was going on in the know. And then in verse 28, Paul picks up again and he says, I am more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again and that I may be less anxious. Now remember, as I said before, Paul's writing these things after the, after the facts, after the events. And he's going to send this very letter to the Philippians, this very epistle that we're reading this morning. He's going to send this with the object of their desire, the object of their concern, the person of their concern, Epaphroditus. He's going to send it home with him. In verse 29, he says, So receive him in the Lord with all joy. Excuse me. With all joy and honor such men. So Paul uses few words, but he says a lot. Honor such men. Paul wants to know that this envoy, this fellow Christian, this brother in Christ that the Philippian church sent him with their care package and provisions did great service in the work of the Lord. Probably some of you didn't even know his name until I brought it up today. But how many of us are Christians that work diligently, but people in the world don't know our names? We're not famous, but we're hard workers, and we do what we can in the way we can as Christians. That makes us an Epaphroditus. I know my grandfather, when he used to preach before he retired, he preached a few sermons on Nero, and he would say, that boy was all uppity and famous for all the wrong reasons. Paul didn't seek fame, and neither did Epaphroditus. He worked hard, and Paul worked hard, and I believe the gospel was successful in Rome. In verse 30, Paul ends it, and he says, for, the, for he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. I think that in a way I can make a connection that us as Christians, when we come together and we edify each other, we complete each other, don't we? Don't you think that's a fair statement, a fair assessment? I mean, nothing can supplant coming together and working with your fellow Christians on Sunday or a Wednesday or a Bible study or any time. That makes us special. That gives us a bond. Now, what happened to Paul and what happened to Epaphroditus? I don't know. We're not told. We don't know how much longer he lived. I can make some speculation as a student of history because I know a little bit about the history of that time in Rome. But Nero in 64 AD, I think it was. You have to understand, like I said before, that Rome was a city of about 4 million people. 90% of them were in poverty. And uh, a lot of wooden structures. The royal palace grounds and the forums were relatively not a huge area compared to the city. And the rumor was, after the fact, historians wrote after the fact, that Nero wanted to expand his royal palaces. So he had the city of Rome burned. The fire lasted for a week. And then hot spots popped up from what I read in the records for weeks after that. It was an absolute disaster. When I think about it, I think of the great fire of Chicago, the fire of San Francisco. This is a city that's comparable in size to those two cities, bigger, bigger population. But what, but what uh, Nero did after that was he saw an opportunity. Nero was an opportunist. 
he blamed it on the Christians. He already had a history with being pretty nasty to the Christians, but he blamed it on the Christians. And it seemed to be from reports you read later on that that was pretty effective. How much longer Paul lived, I don't know. There's legends about where he went after that, that he even went in to Spain, different places, different things. I don't know what happened to Paul. What happened to Epaphroditus, as I said before, I don't know. The legend and tradition is, is that the apostle Peter was crucified in Rome around the time of the persecutions of the Christians of the burning of Rome. And he was crucified, you know, upside down because he said he didn't feel like he could be crucified like his Lord. And he was crucified, I think it was on a Latin cross upside down. But Paul wouldn't have been crucified. I'll tell you why. Paul was executed, he was probably beheaded. Because according to, uh, according to Roman law, a Roman citizen couldn't be crucified. You could use a variety other, from other executions, but that was considered too crass for even the most hardened criminal with Roman citizenship. So that's why the legend is, is tradition is that Paul was eventually beheaded, Apostle Peter was crucified. Epaphroditus was a, a man that we know little about. I can expand a little bit more on him here. I'm amazed that I got this far on seven verses. He had a pagan name, which wasn't, from what I read, wasn't really common around the area that he was at in Philippi. Not that there weren't pagans, there were lots of pagans there. But this was a Greek name, and I think Philippi is what, southern Macedonia, upper Greece. And as I said before, it means, it means beautiful one or belonging to Aphrodite. Aphrodite, if you don't know, was goddess of love. The legend goes that she washed up in a seashell on the shore of Cyprus. It sounds like, sounds like a little saying you say on the tip of your tongue, seashells on the shore. Well, that's who he was named after. And then the speculation arose on the research from some scholars that uh, he was either a, as I said before, he could have been either a retired Roman legionnaire or a retired Praetorian guard or at least second generation from someone who was. Maybe his father was, father and mother were. We know that the church is after that. They grew in strength. The gospel grew in strength because within just a few short centuries, even by the time of uh, Septimus Severus, my, one of my favorite emperors to study, Christianity was taken hold and then it would, become, it would become the religion of the empire about 300 years later. Severus, Christians were persecuted under him in 193 to 211 AD, but he had a Christian personal physician. And in the record, he intervened on the part of several high-profile Christians to stop their trials. So while he didn't personally persecute the Christians, he let it happen. But we saw that just as Christ has said, his word would conquer the world, and it did. Now, you know, we sit in our air conditioning. We're not persecuted. You're listening to a bad speaker as me. But look at the comfort we have and the ease we have. Then I think back on Epaphroditus almost dying and the persecution they suffered then. It was just incredible. So I've made, I've, I've baked a cake for you out of nothing. It's about seven verses. I, if there's any, I'd like to hear some input. If there's anybody with any, uh, anything you want to say, we still got about uh, 10 minutes left. about Nero and, you know, him bringing persecution to Christians and everything. All of that was in God's timing, mm -hmm. in providential timing, because right. in the book of Acts, 
they brought Paul before Gallio. He didn't care anything about it. He thought there's no difference between Jews and Christians. Yeah. And so it took the Romans a while to understand these are two different categories of people. Right. And so God, I think in his providence, did that to give the Christians that were new converts time to grow and mature in the faith. But then when you come to the early, mid-60s, then the early days of work. And, um, and so, but that was all in God's time. Exactly. God knew exactly what he was doing. But there you hit the nail right on the head. This goes back to what I said before was Paul claiming citizenship or want to have the right as a Roman citizen to go before Caesar was brilliantly strategically and in God's plan because he had time. And just as Barry said, Nero, as bad as he was, he was the most powerful man in the world for 14 years. He could have you put to death at the snap of your fingers. He didn't stop Christianity. It grew and it flourished. Because as long as there were unheralded, well, Paul heralded him, but outside of Paul, as long as there were unheralded, everyday, common Christians like Epaphroditus, Christianity would succeed, and it did. We can apply that to ourselves today. We always think, what can I do? I don't make a difference. Look how evil the world is. No, you can make a big difference. If you're a Christian, you do your best you treat others the way you want to be treated. I know that sounds like it's cliche, but it's really not. Sometimes cliches are just things that people don't follow, but they like to say. But if you live your life and make the best choices you can, as a Christian, we can be an Epaphroditus. We can make a big impact in somebody's life. We can help somebody that needs our help or our, sh our shoulder. Anyone else want to make a comment? just watched a report on the Ukraine the other day, and it's uh, the Russians, well, I'm not going to say Russians, but it's because I'm, endear I'm in condemning an entire group of people. The leader, military leadership, and the civilian leadership of the Russian military, their, their war goal, or the way they win a war, is to blit it scorched earth. If I can't get the rabbit out of the hole, I'll just throw a stick of dynamite down the hole. That's the Russians' philosophy of war campaigning in a nutshell. So they destroy every, and all these children and everything. It's just, uh, it just makes, and like Barry said, it just breaks your heart. How could God let this happen? But you know, you know what, though, too, to add to that? There are wars going on and genocide going on and injustice is going on in the Sudan, in Yemen, in lo lots of parts of Africa. There is suffering, torture going on everywhere in the world. So when we think of Ukraine, I also think of these places. I used to have a friend that was a missionary to Ethiopia. Well, he wasn't a friend, he was a work colleague of mine and stuff. And he was saying, you know, you see this, you see, as a Christian, you want to help. I'm going to be a missionary. I'm going to go over there and I'm going to make a difference. Then you go over there, and he says, you get in there with a missionary that's from there, or you're there for a while, and then you feel ashamed. I feel so ashamed that I thought that I had suffered in my life as a Christian. I'm ashamed that I thought that these people could benefit from me. But he said, you know what happened? After I was there for six months, and I came home, I realized 
I wasn't the one that helped them. They helped me. That made me better. So, yeah, you, you, we look at Nero and, and, and Paul, and we think it's as wicked as Nero was. How could God allow this to happen? It was in his time. And you see, we see today, 1948 years later, how, how it, or 1840 years later, how it worked out, don't we? Or 1940, I don't know. I'm trying to I'm trying to do math in my head after after the effects of COVID here. Um, any other comments? It's um, something that a lot of people gloss over um, when they talk about Christian persecution in the Roman Empire. It's the fact that Christianity was the last sheep out of all religions because the Romans were very hands off on their approach. That's what made them so successful. Exactly. I mean, you have to understand that paganism was a religious mess, not a religion. In paganism, if you followed the formula, you should have good luck. If you turned around three times, put, touched your nose, uh, gave the God this many offerings on this day at this time of the day, sprinkled it with milk from a goat or something like that, and you did everything perfectly, you'll have success. They had priests that were trained to do just this thing. All the emperors, before they went on campaigns or they went to battle or anything like that, they would have elaborate rites performed. They had hundreds of, you know in Rome, that they even had a god for the opening and closing of doors. There was a god for that. I don't know when you would ever utilize that god. I mean, you know, my door fell off the other day. I better pray to the god of doors. I don't know. They were crazy about that. Whereas, like... Christianity was a religion. You enveloped yourself wholly in it. You embraced the suffering. Romans couldn't understand that. How can you worship a God and then somebody kills your family or something like this and you still worship that God? You know what a Roman would do? I'm worshiping the wrong gods. I better switch it up. I'm going to go to some other deities here. You know, if you see on TV, even in the Forum at Rome, all these hundreds of statues. Remember the famous uh, Paul, a statue that was erected to an unknown god? Remember that in Athens? That's what that is. They had so many gods that you could pray to God for anything and just to cover their bases because they weren't sure if they were being heard or not, we'll just put a statue up to any god we missed. And Paul saw that and was like, what? And then he correctly and brilliantly pointed it out to the Greeks there how bizarre that was. Remember on Mars Hill, his uh, Paul speech on Mars Hill? But uh, that's about all I have for you this morning. I'm about croaked out and talked out. and I've made, like my grandfather said, I've turned a, made a mountain out of a molehill in information. So I appreciate you being here and listening to me. And even though I look like I'm a little under weather, I thoroughly enjoy it. I'm so glad to be back. It's so good to see y'all's faces. Because when I'm watching our live stream, I don't see anybody. I just see who's up here, who's down there. But I maybe in the first two or three rows, I'll see the back of somebody's heads on live stream. And then a little bit after, you know, service or something. But that's it. But I'm so glad to see everybody here. But that's all, that's all I have for you this morning. So thank you for bearing with me.